Thank you all so much for being here. Um, as Deanna said, I um, was hired by post, the Devil's Post Pile to study the trees that fell down um, in the windstorm that happened in November. So I'm really, I've been out in the field for the last month, um, digging around in the trees with a hard hat on and measuring them, studying them. You can actually see in this picture here, there is a measuring tape going across the trees I've been out there crawling up and over and under the trees and trying to understand um, what any patterns in what we saw and what came down. Um, so we knew that there was an unusual wind event that had happened. What we didn't know was that it had caused a tremendous blowdown in the Reds Valley area. So fortunately, backcountry travelers uh, were out hiking. Actually, there was a backcountry ice skater who was out traveling around Reds Meadow Valley and reported back to the post pile, hey, a lot of trees came down. You guys should get down there. So we sent some of our staff down there to assess the extent of the damage. And this is a photograph of, this is actually a trail you guys are probably familiar with, Devil's Post Pile to Rainbow Falls. Trail usually takes maybe an hour to get down, and it took our staff three hours that day to get. We're really looking forward to hopefully getting some aerial photography eventually so we can truly assess the extent of the windstorm uh, or of the blowdown. Uh, but for now, here's what we have. This is a map a little bit hard to see from Inyo National Forest, but maybe you can pick out some of your favorite trails there. And the ones that are highlighted in orange are in tr um, trail segments that were reported as impassable by a survey from Inyo National Forest staff uh, from February. And that's, those are trails that uh, crews have been working hard to clear. They looked at 45 miles of trail out of Reds Meadow Valley, and that was about nine trails in total, and found that half of them were densely covered with downed trees. All, tr all of the trails were obstructed to some level, though. Um, the PCT and the Pacific Crest Trail and the John Muir Trail uh, were both highly obstructed, as well as um, Upper Rush Creek, and Fish Creek, Mammoth Pass, um, River High, and Shadow Creek Trails, Agnew Meadows, they're all really highly impacted areas. Um, and then further south, we thought maybe Reds Meadow Valley was the epicenter, but <laughs> turns out there are um, other areas that have been affected, Paiute Pass Trail, uh, Duck Pass, and as we just showed up in Yosemite. And then a lot of developed sites have been affected we had a couple of buildings get damaged at the post pile, and a lot of the campgrounds were also damaged. So the, this is a map of the post pile itself, and these trails that are highlighted in yellow were the ones that were heavily obstructed. And as you can see, that's about 100% of the <laughs> monument. <laughs> Just this little area that is in the middle of the 1992 Rainbow Falls burn that there really aren't that many trees there anyway, um, <laughs> wasn't affected. So uh, the trails down there have, have been highly obstructed by trees. And in my research, um, I've been counting trees in the post pile. And we have, on average, 190 blown down trees per mile. We lost our big trees. Um, and this is really typical for a big blowdown event, actually. It turns out all the studies on forest blowdowns have basically found the same thing, that the large trees get knocked down. An average tree diameter at about like my height um, in the post pile before the blowdown is 23 cent centimeters around. And the average size of a tree that came down is twice that, at, over twice that, at 55 centimeters. Oh, and here's, this is a photograph of um, Lindsay Swinger, who came out to help me um, in the field one day. And she is trying to get the diameter of this enormous tree. It just kind of shows. She's about my size, how big these trees are that came down. OK. So um, like I said, I wanted to understand, was there any particular type of tree that was vulnerable to this wind event? 
And the answer is no. The wind was indiscriminate. It just, whatever was there, it knocked down. Unless it was big, in which case it preferentially knocked that down because big trees stick out and they really are exposed to the wind. Um, so the wind direction, or the direction that the trees fell was strikingly south-southwest, um, which really makes sense. The wind came in from the north-northeast and then toppled the trees south-southwest um, in this really even pattern that we're seeing out there. It almost looks like somebody laid out trunks for a log cabin. Um, and what's neat about it, and, and maybe you'll see this this summer when you're out hiking, is that the trees from our prevailing winds that get knocked down usually every winter are underneath these freshly blown down trees and they create this crisscross pattern because our, uh, this event, the wind came from the opposite direction of where we typically get wind. Um, okay, so most of our trees, 86% in fact, were uprooted. Um, so you have this huge root wad sticking out. Only 14% were snapped. And the reason for that is wind speed. Um, intermediate wind speeds tend to uproot trees, and then really high wind speeds snap trees. Um, and we had a, about 12 hours of this intermediate wind speed for our forest. So that's a really interesting thing to see is these enormous root wads everywhere. So in certain areas, you're hiking around and you see um, a lot of trees are uprooted, but then there's these ridge lines and, and, and different patches where everything is snapped. And that has to do with the, um, the wind itself and the patterns of the wind, which I don't know that much about. So I'm going to turn it over to Rhett, who's going to talk about how it all happened and, um, and the meteorology, the weather behind it. So, thank you. OK. <laughs> That's what caused it. <laughs> so we obviously know we had an incredible windstorm come through here. Um, and I first want to thank uh, Mammoth Mountain, especially the, the ski patrol, Ned, Bear, for getting me some data, which was really important into understanding how extreme this wind event was. Because I was able to go back about 12 years of strong wind data over the top of Mammoth to kind of get a comparison of how strong these winds were compared to other strong Mona winds or east wind events. But in summary, as you already know, some incredible winds came through. Uh, the core of the winds happened from about 4 p.m. on uh, November 30th through about 7 a.m. on December 1st. And obviously, you guys know the trees came down. But what's really interesting about this case is just the magnitude of how long these wind speeds occurred. Uh, I was able to go into the Mammoth Mountain database and go through about 12 years of data Again, there were a few gaps in data, and I'm sure there were some minor quality control issues here and there. But overall, I was able to find out uh, other east wind events that have occurred. If you look at these winds, sustain 92 gust to 120, sustain 90 gust to 112. If you look at these ones and you compare it to this devil's windstorm, it's not even close. 150 sustained, these ones barely even get to 100. This is 12 years worth of data. So that tells you 12 years worth of data, and we can't even get anything even remotely close to what we experienced um, on that November 30th, December 1st. So if we compared all these cases and looked at what happened with them, again, here's the wind and wind gusts off Mammoth Gondola. I didn't talk about the 700 millibar temperatures, but don't worry about that. They're all pretty close. What jumps out at you? Huge. Huge difference. And then the duration. Fourteen hours sustained winds over 120 miles an hour. All these other ones, that's why the duration of this event was just so extreme. So now let's get into the meteorology and talk a little bit about uh, what exactly happened. This is the actual weather pattern that occurred during this event. And this is looking at about 20,000 feet in the Earth's atmosphere. about getting close up towards jet stream level. And the main features, if I can figure out how this laser works, there we go. Everybody talks about this huge low pressure system that came in here that caused this wind, all this wind damage. And that's this low pressure system right here. But what's even more impressive is you have this huge high, high pressure system that's off the coast. 
If it was just this low pressure system, it probably wouldn't have been a big deal. But the fact is, is we also had a huge high pressure system. And the combination of those two working in concert is really what created the really strong winds. So these are the actual wind speeds from the Mammoth Gondola. And one thing that you'll notice is this is the sustained winds on this first column here that I've shaded. These are sustained on top of the mountain. 140 miles an hour sustained. That's crazy. <laughs> right here is the gusts. Uh, it says 150 miles an hour, but I was talking with Ned at the ski resort, and he was saying they accidentally trumped their equipment to stop at 150 miles an hour. Normally, they set it more for 180, um, 180 miles an hour, which we have seen and we do get uh, quite often. Well, not quite often, but we do get 170, 180 mile an hour winds, but they're usually from the west or southwest. The trees and everything is used to that kind of wind direction, and this is east winds or, or east northeast. So you can see just incredible wind speeds that are unfortunately capped at 150 miles an hour. Normally, if it's sustained 150, you're gusting at least 180, 190 especially on top of ridges. Once you get down lower, those numbers are a little bit different, but you can see just incredible wind speeds over the top of Mammoth during this wind event. What's really unique about east wind events is they come up to the crest and then they accelerate down. And if you can look at the, the Mammoth Airport during this wind event, the winds were only gusting 35, 40 miles an hour. And it tells you that once you get up in elevation and how important it is for winds to hit the crest of the Sierra and duck down and crash down and that's really where you see the, the downslope effect is as they duck down. And we'll get more into that in just a minute. So how strong is 150 miles an hour sustained? It's an EF3 tornado. So this is the enhanced Fujita scale. We're talking category three. Impressive. How strong is 150 miles an hour in the hurricane scale? Category four. What's really cool when you look at some of these areas is the whole ball of root is flipped up on its side. So let's look a little bit more in detail about the actual uh, topography and why this made, was such an interesting case. Again, the winds are out of the north northeast, so they're coming at this direction. And when we're looking at downslope wind storms, the most important thing is you want winds perpendicular to the mountain range. The more perpendicular they are, the more that they can duck down. And so you can see out of a north northeast, we're in a very nice setup right over here. Tahoe is pretty good, but they have a tend to get a little bit more of a straight east to west, and it's a little bit better down here out of that north-northeast direction. But what's even more important is you notice this north-northeast drainage within here. A lot of these other drainages that you see in the Sierra tend to go a little bit more east to west. This one has the best north to northeast uh, orientation down drainage, and I think that has a lot to do with why the greatest damage was here. When we look at downslope windstorms, we normally are looking at it from the other side of the crest coming over, but in this case here, we're looking at it, all, all the air coming up, we have upslope coming up all the way across the Great Basin, upsloping up into Mammoth, and then it comes crashing down this first ridge. And that first ridge is usually the most dangerous spot to be in a downslope windstorm because that's where the greatest forcing, the greatest wave crashing, the greatest everything comes together is on that first ridge buckling over on either side of the crest depending on the wind direction. Again, what potentially made this such a big event is the drainage being north-northeast and being able to channel everything through. We got the, the minarets and the Ritter Range and everything that's lining up and trying to funnel flow right through there. So we have a downslope signature and then you have incredible wind that's also trying to channel through the valley as well. So you have a lot of things working in concert uh, to create such a big event. So let's get into downslope windstorms. And this is kind of a perfect simulation of what you would look at in a downslope windstorm. So this is a mountain range over here. It's a perfect mountain range, perfectly symmetrical. And you'll notice this flow coming up into this mountain range is pretty smooth. But notice what happens when this flow hits this mountain range. It creates all kinds of chaos. And the biggest chaos is this first wave right here. That is the main downslope signature. And you can imagine it like almost like uh, water flowing over this mountain range. And it comes, and it comes crashing to the ground. But not only does it come crashing to the ground, but you see a lot of chaos afterwards, where you have upward and downward motions going all over the place. 
When we're looking at downslope windstorms, the greatest damage we're going to expect is in this area where this wave crashes down. It gets pretty turbulent. You get a lot of strong winds out here, but it doesn't tend to be as extreme as what you see right in that first initial downslope area. And I'll get a little bit more into that in a moment. Here's another kind of simulation of flow going over mountain range. But you notice all the crazy eddies and circulations, things hug the, the, the terrain, and then they break and they cause chaos. And so um, just another kind of visual example of what's going on. Whenever we're looking at a really strong wind event, we have to have a stable atmosphere. You have to. A stable atmosphere means that wind coming up and hits this mountain, it rises over, and it has to come exactly back down to where it started. If you were trying to have a downslope windstorm without stable air, this is what happens. The air would rise up, hit the mountain, and just go straight up into the air and turn into rain or clouds or precipitation. So stable air mass is absolutely critical to downslope windstorms, and we'll look into how stable the atmosphere was during this event. From the meteorologist's perspective, we tend to look at different fields that try to tell us if something's stable or unstable. For example, this is a cross section. I, I know it's a little bit hard to see, but here's a cross section over the Sierra. Both of them are cross sections over the Sierra. One is a stable environment, and I don't want to get into the details of what fields we look at in meteorology, but the most important thing is where you see these lines stacked on top of each other, it tells you you're in a very stable atmosphere, and the airflow, if it hit a mountain, is just going to duck right back down. Stable over here, unstable over here. These lines are not stacked on top of each other. Okay, maybe they are just slightly, but this is an unstable atmosphere. If, uh, if this flow were to hit a mountain range, it, was, it would just continue to go straight up. Stable, lines stacked on top of each other, unstable, they're not. Just keep that in mind. This is the downslope windstorm. What does that look? Does that look stable or unstable? Stable. Yep. You can see the flow coming. Notice how I show those perfect simulations, how everything is coming across. And then it hits the mountain range, and then it creates all this chaos. But the most important thing is this ducting that's going on right here. And this is what a computer model was predicting during this downslope wind, wind event, was that we would have this type of pattern set up, which is, you know, which is very favorable to a downslope windstorm. One way to kind of think about how these things work, this temperature over here is 285 degrees Kelvin. Don't worry about the units or anything like that. Just know that this number is 285. If you were to go on the east side or the west side of the Sierra, this is a cross section right through Mammoth area. I know it's a little bit hard to see up here. There's a little map that shows you that. But this temperature right here is 285 degrees Kelvin. For you to get to that area, you have to go all the way down to near the Sacramento Valley. And that's that warming that we talk about that occurs from that latent heat of those clouds and precipitation that develops is it adds heat to the air mass. And so at 285, degree, or 285 degrees, this air mass right here is pretty happy. But once you get it right to the edge of this cliff, where does it want to go? Down. So it comes crashing down, and that helps drive the wind. So let's take a look at what the downslope windstorm or the devil's windstorm, what it looked like. This is a point looking just above Mammoth, looking straight up in the air, and you notice how these lines are stacked on top of each other. And this is the beginning of, this is about the start of the windstorm, and this is about where the windstorm ends, is right in here. And so you can see extremely stable atmosphere, extremely conducive to a downslope wind event until we get to this area where the wind starts to turn upward and it becomes unstable and it's not likely. What else could have happened to cause this? These are really the only other logical explanations. You could have had what they call uh, the jet stream protrude from way up high and come down to the surface and you could get some very strong winds in that. You can also get low-level barrier jets and those barrier jets can be 70, 80, 100 miles an hour but the direction is completely wrong. Barrier jets form when they're in the south to southwest flow, not in east to northeast flow. So we can cross that one off. Downburst, we had no thunderstorms. We didn't have a dry air mass. It can't be a downburst like you see in a lot of uh, kind of uh, forests that get blown over. You do get a lot of downburst winds from thunderstorms, and that's not the case. So let's talk a little bit about the jet stream, because it seems like the jet stream would mm, have some influence of what's going on here. What we're doing is we're looking at the jet stream. at a, We're about 30,000 feet in the air. 
And where you're seeing these yellows and reds, or I'm sorry, these yellows and greens and oranges, it's the core of the jet stream. So that trough, if you follow the jet stream, would be right in here. And here's the center of the low where you don't have hardly wi any wind at all. So the jet stream is bending that much? The jet stream bends that much. Wow. Yep. And so this is about the beginning, this is about two or three hours before the downslope windstorm event occurs. And you'll notice the winds really aren't that strong over the Mammoth area at all. The strongest jet is still well north up towards Alturas, uh, north of Sacramento. You do have a bit of the jet stream around the outside, but right over the Mammoth area, there's really not much jet stream at all. This is the start of the windstorm. Now we're getting more into the windstorm. Now we're getting closer to the, where the strongest winds start occurring. Again, we have picked up quite a bit of wind um, compared to what we saw earlier, but the big core of the jet stream is still north of the Tahoe area. It's still up here, and it's also displaced further towards the west and towards the south. So again, we're still not even in the core of the jet stream. It's not even over our head, but yet we're having this incredible windstorm going on, and so the jet stream doesn't seem like it's adding a huge component to it. Another thing about the jet stream as well is the jet stream is strongest when it comes from the west. The Pacific jet stream that brings us the monster winter storms, that's often 180, 200 miles an hour in really good storms. During east wind events, the jet stream isn't really that strong in comparison. A little bit hard to see here, but it looks like about 120 knots. In jet stream news, that's not a big deal. That's an average jet stream, not a, not a, not a super strong one. We're coming now towards the end of the wind event. Again, now the jet stream is starting to move a bit closer towards us. Of course, the winds are a bit further towards the north, but you can see it wrapping around quite nicely. But again, we're starting to get in the core of the jet stream, but again, we're also getting towards the end of the wind event. How do we know if the jet stream would have done it? Is, is, is the, here's the surface. Here's looking up. All weather occurs in the troposphere. I should have mentioned that to start. All weather occurs in the troposphere. That's indicated by this white area. But if you can get the jet stream to work a little magic, you could take the, troposphere, you could take the, tropo, uh, the stratosphere and you can actually duct it down to the surface. And we call that a tropopause fold. And this black indicates stratospheric ear that is actually protruding down, and those sometimes can lead to incredible windstorms. Did that happen in this case? We can look at the jet stream, we can look at the uh, fields to see how far the jet stream is coming down, to, or I'm sorry, the, the stratosphere is coming down to the surface. And uh, I, I, I won't get into too much, but it's saying it's only going to get down to about 25,000 feet. From the, you're at, the jet stream comes down to about 25,000 feet and doesn't get any lower. So at first look, the jet stream doesn't seem like it's ha it has some influence on it because the direction is from the, the north northeast. But being in the core of the jet stream, we can't exactly say that's the main reason why we got it. So now let's look at some pressure gradients. Two things to notice about pressure gradients. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a line right here, the Nevada border, you know, California. So here's southern Nevada, the pressure, about 1,003 millibars. Up to the north here, about 1,028, 1,029 millibars. So we're talking about 26 millibars of pressure across Nevada. But you'll also notice a pretty impressive pressure gradient across the Sierra. If we were to look at a big weather model, which we will in a little bit, but you won't see this pressure gradient across the Sierra. You'll just see this pressure gradient from north to south. And that's what's so unique about the Sierra here is the influence that it has on things like pressure gradients. This pressure gradient just across the Sierra, maybe 50 miles, is about 8 or 10 millibars. And this is a, just before the wind storm really starts going. Again, about 8 to 10 millibars across the Sierra, but again, a huge pressure gradient from north to south across the state of Nevada. And again, notice the pressure gradients over Southern California as well. That's why they had strong winds um, and damage there in addition. So now we're getting close to the time that the downslope windstorm really starts going. Again, looking at this pressure gradient towards Southern Nevada, about 1,005 or so. Up here, about 1,037. So we're talking about a 32 millibar pressure gradient. I know that doesn't seem like a lot because you're not used to looking at pressure gradients, but that's just an absolutely incredible pressure gradient across the area. Now if you combine that with a pressure gradient across the Sierra, now this pressure gradient's gotten even tighter and we're looking at about 10 millibars of pressure gradient across the Sierra. So we have 
Also, as I mentioned before, you know, the packing of the lines tell you how strong the winds are. Do you think this packing of lines is as impressive as this packing of lines? There's no, there's no comparison. So the pressure gradient right up into the Sierra is absolutely ridiculous, and that's really what drove your winds. Here we're looking uh, about three hours later. Again, pressure gradients. But notice that the pressure gradients across the entire Sierra are doing pretty good. So why did, again, the you know, mammoth, why did we devil's post pile it get so much worse winds compared to other portions of the Sierra? During this time, at this rate, at, at this time that this is going on, this is where the, the big party is. You can see the strongest pressure gradient is here. Everything's right across the Sierra. But later, as we go into time, it'll, you'll see um, strong winds up here as well. But again, this pressure gradient, about 10 millibars. And this is just a computer model that can't resolve the terrain quite as well as it, as it, as it could. And I'll explain that in just a second. Again, another pressure gradient. This is right towards the end of it, about 1,002 to about 1,039. So 38, 39. So we're talking a huge, incredible pressure gradient. And I'll show you some comparisons with other strong east wind events so you get a feel for what that means. We were able to run a high resolution uh, computer model on these pressure gradients or on this uh, windstorm case to see what this uh, high resolution computer model. I should mention this computer model is resolution is 12 kilometers. Each grid box is 12 kilometers. This computer model is two kilometers. So it's a very high resolution computer model. It can actually capture some of the terrain around the area. And this is what's really impressive here is before in that other computer model, it was showing about a 10 millibar difference in pressure gradient. This high resolution pre uh, computer model that is looking at a bit more terrain going across, uh, where's the mammoth? It's a little hard for me to tell, but I think that's right there. But you can see this pressure gradient during this windstorm, 20 millibars in 13 miles. Before, you're talking 20 millibars that takes you that long to get 20. And you did it in 13. <laughs> so again, I just wanted to mention in closing here, huge pressure gradient looks to be the main driver. That's why it wasn't just windy here. It was windy everywhere across the area, Southern California as well. Again, pressure gradient. This is looking at those general maps. You don't see that huge type pressure gradient across the Sierra because this computer model can't resolve it. OK, now we went from a huge bad resolution computer model to a finer one. Okay, now it sees this huge pressure gradient. And now we see the real pressure gradient when we go to two kilometers, 20 millibars. In those previous cases, it took 20 millibars across the entire state of Nevada. This pressure gradient is in 13 miles. So uh, I think this is my last slide, or the one after is my last slide. Again, we know these downslope windstorms occur. We just have to pay strong attention to the location of that low and also to the pressure gradient. If we see those pressure gradients, we should expect a strong downslope windstorm. This wasn't a huge surprise. Uh, the Weather Service in Hanford had high wind warnings for downslope windstorm on their side. We didn't have much in our forecast. Uh, we had winds up to 100 miles an hour over the crest. But as I mentioned, the airport at Mammoth, Mammoth Airport, gusted 35 to 40. So unless you went up on top of the mountain on this side of the hill, you didn't have anything going on. If you went on the other side, whole nother story. So just in summary, strong pressure gradient. Weather models predicted it fairly well, other than underdoing the winds. This drainage happened to be the most perfect aligned north to northeast. And the stability, pressure gradients, topography, hydraulic jump created the perfect downslope windstorm. And it doesn't seem like the jet stream really touched down was very likely. Um, nothing that we were able to look at showed anything like that. It showed everything being pressure gradient driven, and that's the reason. So I'll stop there. Thank you.